On the 22nd day of October, Halloween gave to me 22 Egyptian eyeballs, 21 acid raves, 20 creepy stalkers, 19 Kiernan's time traveling, 18 zombie swatting, 17 Kegner screeching, 16 flying engines, 15 workplace accidents, 14 logs of bouncing, 13 planes exploding, 12 zombie soldiers, 11 angels wrestling, 10 ghostly hitchhikers, 9 basement clowns, 8 vampire cruises, 7 silent heroes, 6 prequel bloodstones, 5 diabolical fledglings, 4 vampire penis, 3 dead professors, 2 Michelle actresses, and a radu drooling something bloody. Hey there, welcome back to the 31 Days of Halloween Celebration. I am Bo, I am your host for these shenanigans the past 21 days and the next 10. I hope you are having an amazing Halloween. And I want to welcome you to the second part of uh, the Fall of the House of Usher, the Netflix series that Mike Flanagan uh, is the showrunner for. Not uh, every episode written and directed by Mike Flanagan, but you can kind of feel him, uh, his tendrils coursing through uh, this show. So when last we left, our heroes, and I put that in big quotes, uh, comfortably seated between sneer quotes, um, we had lost a couple of the kids. And by couple, I mean uh, Perry, uh, the raver. We had lost um, Leo the video game uh, maker and we had lost uh, Camille our, uh, our our kind of snoop our, our information getter of, of uh, the series and the surprise surprise the rest of this uh, the series gets rid of the other kids and does so in in fairly gruesome fashion most of the time uh, the fifth episode is entitled The Telltale Heart, uh, which is unsurprisingly about uh, Victorine or Vic, the uh, one of the bastard children of the House of Usher, who is um, trying to perfect this mesh device that fits around a heart that sort of monitors uh, for illness and eventually will allow uh, the, the mesh thing to keep a heart beating. Roderick Usher has a vested interest in seeing this thing come to life, and Vic is uh, perhaps not necessarily always on the up and up in what she is reporting about the relative success of this device. Uh, but the the thing that's interesting about this episode is how they manage to weave the story of the Telltale Heart into this. It ends up being fairly gruesome. Uh, but kind of wonderful. And it's a, a pretty nice reveal of, you know, what the episode has kind of been about all along, even though you weren't really aware of that. And this is also a, a beginning point in the back end of the series where Madeline and Roderick Usher, who are realizing, like, something is targeting these children and we have to figure out what's up. One thing I didn't mention in the previous episode, uh, because he doesn't play that big a role in the first four episodes and really doesn't come to the fore until the last couple, but Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker himself, has been bouncing around this show uh, playing uh, a guy named uh, Pym. The, the, uh, they call him the Pym Reaper, as a matter of fact. And he is a guy... Um, who is an attorney, he's been with the family forever and ever, and his whole job is to fix problems, whether they're legal or otherwise. He has clearly done some kind of heinous stuff. And I don't want to go too far into describing his actions through the story because uh, he's amazing. He, he's sort of hovering around the edges of the story most of the time, uh, gathering information for Roderick and Madeline and Mark Hamill, uh, his performance in this is so goddamn good. 
Uh, he's gruff and confident, but there's a point where he's clearly shaken by the events of the, the story. And there's this wonderful moment, which I, I will kind of spoil this, and it's not a big spoiler at all. It's just a little bit of backstory for the character. But there's one point where Roderick is talking to uh, the, the investigator, Dupin, um, you know, making his confession, and they're talking about uh, Pym. And Roderick says, oh, do you remember there was this, uh, an expedition that went around the world, and Pym was part of that. Like, he, he had just left college, and he somehow gets himself involved with this group, and they go around the world. They go from the South Pole to the North Pole, and there is a, a, a story that Pym tells, but he doesn't tell the whole story. He tells up to a point of something he saw in the North Pole, and there was a game that everyone in the family has uh, of filling in the blank parts of that story. And you never really get an explicit description of what he saw. But clearly what he saw was something that makes him believe in the supernatural. and Or the, the possibility of it. And there's a great scene between uh, him and Carlo Gugino... And it is tremendous. I love it dearly. There are a couple of moments with her in these last episodes that are just tremendous. And this is one of them. Her and Mark Hamill working across from one another is just a thing of pure beauty. And Mark Hamill's so good in this. Uh, he, I'm glad he's in the Mike Flanagan averse now, as we call it here on this show. The, the Flaniverse, the Flanaganiverse, something like that. But I'm glad he's part of that stable now. I hope he comes back again and again because he was amazing. And it's a very particular role and it doesn't call for a lot of range. And I know Hamill's actually got that kind of range. Like he was the anime Joker for God's sake. So we know he can play big and broad. And this performance is so withdrawn and careful and... It's, it's just terrific. He's so good in this. I love him to death. And and uh, his fate in the story is something I really adore as well. So there's that. There's the Telltale Heart, which is great. Uh, then there's uh, Goldbug, um, which is the story of Tamerlane, Tammy uh, Usher, one of the, the two uh, main ushers, or at least the, the children of... Roderick and Annabelle Lee, um, his first marriage. And we get kind of her breakdown. And Tamerlane isn't somebody we talked a lot about in the first episode either. She's a really interesting character. I think that maybe she is a little underserved in this story. I get what the character is. Don't get me wrong. Like, I understand what her character is about. But I, I wish that we had a little more time with her, or maybe there just isn't that much more to her than what the, the story gives us. But she's interesting. She's a fascinating character, and her relationship with her husband is really weird, and there's this like bizarre psychosexual element to it. But it's also about her being an observer and not really a participant in her own life, and that there's something that gets her off about... Um, the ordinary and the normal and, and something that she never quite achieves. Uh, she's an interesting character, to be sure. And she has a pretty great um, bow out of the show. Uh, and and uh, there again, there's a moment with her and Carla Gugino, who again remains fantastic in this show, where, uh, you know, one of the things that Gugino's character gives every ki all of the kids uh, there's a moment where she she sort of interacts with them and uh, you know says like hey you would have had this other life had had you not been so fucked up you would have had this other life and gives them a glimpse of that and and seems to have some sympathy for the for these children 
um, even as she, you know, if not orchestrates, certainly observes their deaths. And it's really interesting. It's a, an interesting dynamic. And her her less moments with Tamerlane are, are great. And then there's the penultimate episode called The Pit and the Pendulum. This is the one where Frederick, uh, Roderick's, uh, you know, firstborn son, gets it. And we're also privy in these last couple of episodes to the fate of Roderick's marriage with Annabelle Lee and how he basically fucked up his kids and, and sealed her fate as well. And again, I don't want to spoil any of this because it's great, but uh, like there, there are payoffs in these last episodes all over the place. So all this stuff that, that is set up through the series of what happened between Roderick and Annabelle Lee? Why did they, uh, why did their relationship end? How did Roderick and Madeline truly come to power? Uh, what is with all these bell sounds? Why is Roderick uh, forever, you know, taking a scotch down to the basement? Um, you know, all of that stuff is, you know, teased all through the the season or the, you know, the seven uh, episodes. And then in episode seven and eight, all these, uh, you know, chickens come home to roost in really satisfying narrative ways. And again, I can't say it's it's as satisfying as Midnight Mass, which may be my favorite thing that Mike Flanagan has done. And I think Hill House is number two because it just knocked me on my ass. And I, I find everything but the final episode to be incredible. This is this has a couple of down episodes that are still really good. They're not great episodes, but it has a much better ending than Hill House did. And probably if I had seen this before I saw Hill House, I don't know. The, the family drama in Hill House I still like more than the family drama in this, although this is maybe more superficially entertaining. And that's not a knock. I mean, I just mean that I, I wasn't as emotionally invested in the characters. It was more like, oh, look at this asshole. I wonder how he's going to get it. Because there's a, this whole dynamic with Frederick and his wife and their daughter, Lenore, who is... Lenore, by the way, is a wonderful character. We haven't talked about her a bunch, but uh, we mentioned last episode, this is Frederick's daughter. It's uh, um, Roderick's granddaughter. He loves her to death. Um, he tells Dupin, like, she is the best of all of us. She is the, uh, she has my drive and ambition and brain and all of the heart of Annabelle Lee. The one thing that she doesn't have that Annabelle Lee had is the broken heart. And that he's doing everything he can to prevent that. And um, her, uh, her journey through the story is kind of incredible. Uh, I really love her character and and there's a, like a, just a heart-wrenching moment with her in the in the final episode. And you know, we also get some moments between Gugino and Roderick finally as well as with Madeline and it like all these payoffs are just they're so good because it's all been building to this thing. And the biggest complaint I have with the final episode is there's a moment where the CGI is kind of shitty. And it if it had been better, it would have been way more effective. And that's, that's a bummer. Uh, and you would know it. If you've seen it, you know the scene I'm talking about with uh, Roderick looking out the window of his offices. And, and you'll know it. And... I don't know that the payoff of what's in the basement is as good as the build up to it, but it's pretty pretty good. It's still pretty satisfying. Like that it's a, that is a minor complaint. If the CGI is my big complaint with the the final episode, this is like, you know, if that's a, a 7 or an 8, this is like a 2 uh in terms of of complaints. Um I love the show. Uh, I will not uh, hide any longer. I think that Fall of the House of Usher is really fun. I don't think it, it is as substantial 
as Midnight Mass or Hill House in terms of the emotional punch uh, and, and the lingering impact. But it's one of those things that I like. I love that now there are these protracted adaptations of Usher and, and Hill House and Midnight Mass. Uh, you know, Blind Man or Lesso. I don't know that I'll go back and revisit that. But I love the idea that, oh, just perpetually during Halloween now, I can go back and revisit these three great series and have, you know, like a full day, like fully 24 hours, if not more, worth of really excellent horror television from Mike Flanagan. And not always Mike Flanagan himself, but his his vibe, his his uh, sort of ethos uh, permeates all of this. And, and it's incredible. This is a really nice... I, I was kind of skeptical going in, especially once I realized that Flanagan had not written and directed it all. But now that I've seen it in its entirety, you know, it's not a, an also-ran. Like, I never actually finished The Midnight Club. Because at a certain point, I was just like, ah, this... This doesn't really feel like it's for me, and it doesn't feel like a thing that Flanagan has his heart in, maybe, uh, the way that he does with Hill House and Midnight Mass. This, uh, whether or not Flanagan had his heart in it, that he he had enough great creators around him that all of this really pays off and really feels like it is of uh, of, of a stripe, that all of it feels connected and... and um, you know, it has the same vibe all through it. Sometimes it's really brutal and nasty, and I love it when the show gets brutal and nasty. But there are some really nice family moments and some re- really nice uh, moments of that are that are heartfelt and and heartbreaking at times. I, yeah, I just love this. I think it's one of my favorite horror things I've seen this year. I think I'm gonna try not to include it on a top ten list because it is a show, and I've I'm trying not to fall into that trap again like I did with. Uh, Hill House and Midnight Mass, but man, it's just so hard when this is so fucking good. Uh, so anyway, uh, as always, j- uh, jump in the Discord. Let me know what you thought of this uh, once you've wrapped it up. I-, I just think it's a tremendous piece of work and and so much fun. Like I was giggling and kind of you know jaw dropped a couple of times with how violent and gruesome it can get, and and just thoroughly entertained throughout. And and it's got such a great Halloween vibe and it. You know, it, like I said, it's it's not just an ad- adaptation of a post story. It is an adaptation of every post story, and manages to get it mostly right, which is fucking crazy. It's 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 like a real achievement. Anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me uh, really gush about it and, and and think about it and and puzzle over it. I really think this is uh, some great work and and a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you get a chance to check it out. It's on Netflix. You know, even if you're not a Netflix subscriber, pay for a month and watch this and, you know, I don't know, watch Hill House again and then cancel your subscription. Uh, All right. That is it for uh, this episode of the 31 Days of Halloween. We will be back on Monday with uh, yet another uh, movie. Uh, We're going to get back to doing a little bit of a one-off kind of thing. And then we've got a series on the back end of that. So, ah, just more fun to come. Everywhere you look, it's great horror stuff happening. Have a great spooky time uh, and be especially spooky out there now that we're in the last, you know, 10 days uh, leading up to Halloween. Uh, Thanks, as always, for listening to the 31 Days of Halloween. I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.